A battle was fought near Maldon in Essex in the year 991. On the one side stood one of England's foremost military commanders, Brithnoth, the Elderman of Essex, along with a large force of Anglo-Saxon warriors intent on defending their homeland from any and all foes who might threaten the sovereignty of their new country. The king of the English at the time, Ethelred, was a ruler already possessing a reputation for reconciliation against his foes rather than fighting. On the other side of the Blackwater River stood a Viking horde from across the sea, intent on ravaging and pillaging the lush pastures of England like their predecessors had done before them. The invaders came from Norway and Denmark, and according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, their leader was a ruler known as Olaf, often identified as the warlord Olaf Tryggvason, soon to be the king of Norway and a warrior known to be active in Britain during this time. England had been ravaged for decades by renewed Viking raids by this point. No longer led by local war leaders, as had generally been the case previously, but now often led by kings and claimants to thrones. The English response to the renewed Viking threat had been split down the middle up until this point, with one half opting to deal with them amicably, paying them off with riches to get them to go away. The other half, of which Earl Brithnoth was a part, opted instead to fight to the last man. According to the epic poem, The Battle of Molden, Olaf addressed the Saxon invaders across a shallow causeway which revealed itself at low tide, promising to sail away with all of his men if he was paid off with enough gold and armour. Brithnoth replied with characteristic stubbornness, We will pay you with spear tips and sword blades. Battle commenced as the land bridge gradually revealed itself, allowing 300 Saxon warriors under the Thanes, Wolfstan, Elfhir and Macus to hold the causeway against the encroaching Norsemen. According to the story, Olaf then asked to be allowed to cross the river so that the two armies could properly do battle. Brithnoth apparently agreed, possibly his pride getting the better of him, and battle was joined. But Brithnoth was apparently betrayed by an Englishman named Godric, who fled upon his horse, leading many of Brithnoth's men into thinking it was their leader who had fled and following him off the field. The Vikings soon triumphed, wiping out the English almost to a man in an epic last stand. Whether or not this account is accurate, or whether it was a later invention for political purposes, it is known that the Scandinavian invaders did indeed win the battle, thus gaining a significant foothold in England for decades to come. If indeed it was Olaf Tryggvason who had led the force, he now stood as one of the foremost Scandinavian leaders in the world, during a time when Scandinavians found themselves in an unprecedented position of power in the politics and society of Northern Europe. In the decades that followed Maldon, Scandinavian warbands would travel across England at will, raiding and stealing, being paid off at times by the English king, and at other times simply taking what they wanted with little repercussions from their actions. It was a time of anarchy, chaos, and lacklustre leadership for the English. For the people of England, the Second Viking Age had truly begun. Like much that happened during this time period, information on the life of Olaf Tryggvason is exceptionally difficult to come by, although a certain amount of information can be learned from a number of heroic Icelandic sagas written down several centuries later. Generally thought to have been the son of Trigg Olafsson, a grandson of the famous Harald Fairhair, the first king of Norway, and the current king of the province of Viken which had become independent once more after the death of Fairhair divided Norway into parts once more, this time between his sons. Dynastic rivalries soon flared up again, and by the early 960s, Olafsson was reportedly lured into a trap and murdered by Harald Greycloak, the son of Eric Bloodaxe and another grandson of Harald Fairhair. The sources differ about what happened to his young son at this point, with some claiming his mother Estrid fled with him to the Orkneys whilst others argue that she took him with her to seek refuge with her family in Sweden. After more dynastic squabbles, which nearly led to the death of the young boy, perhaps after a period of enslavement by Estonian pirates in the Baltic Sea, he eventually appears in the Kievan Rus at the court of Prince Vladimir the Great, himself a ruler with strong historic links with Scandinavia. As Olaf grew older, Vladimir made him the captain of his household guards, 
but after serving for a few years, the king apparently became wary of Olaf and his popularity with his soldiers. Fearing that he might be a threat to the safety of this region, Vladimir stopped treating Olaf as a friend, and he thus decided that it would be better for him to seek his fortunes elsewhere and set out for the Baltic. The Chronicle, Heimskringla, states that after leaving Novgorod, Olaf raided settlements and ports around the Baltic Sea with great success. In 982, he was caught in a storm and made port in Wendland, in the modern-day Baltic states, and soon became involved in the struggles of the local ruler, Burislav, and his daughter, Princess Geira, whom Olaf soon married in the first of many shrewd diplomatic marriages he would make during his lifetime. Olaf began to reclaim rebellious baronies which had refused to pay taxes, and after these successful campaigns, he began raiding further afield towards Skane and Gotland, and ever closer towards his own homeland. Whilst it isn't exactly clear at what point Olaf converted to Christianity, he is said to have fought alongside a Christian monarch, Otto II, the Holy Roman Emperor during this time. Otto had raised a great army of Wends, Saxons, Frisians and Franks in order to fight against the pagan Norse and Danish, who Olaf may have wanted to fight simply to try and reclaim his family's lands, rather than out of a spiritual conviction. Otto's army met the armies of King Harald Bluetooth and Hakon Jarl, the ruler of Norway under the Danish king. At the Daneverk, a great defensive wall on the border of Germany and Denmark, Otto's army was unable to break the fortification, so he changed tactics and sailed around it, landing in Jutland with a large fleet. Otto won a great battle there, and subsequently forced Harald Bluetooth and Hakon Jarl, along with their armies, to convert to Christianity. After Olaf had spent three years in Wendland, his wife Geira died in 984, and he set out to plunder again in that year, raiding from Friesland to the Hebrides, spending significant amounts of time in England and Ireland. In 988, Olaf met and married Gaida, the sister of the current Norse king in Dublin, Olaf Sitrikson, who proved to be a powerful ally. It was another politically sound marriage, and the pair are said to have spent half of their time in England and the other half in Ireland, as Olaf likely continued to amass himself a fortune with which he could use to reclaim the throne of Norway. It is within this context that the Battle of Maldon was fought in 991, if Olaf was indeed the warlord who led the Vikings that day, then he was likely highly content to simply be paid off by the English. Brithnoth's dogged persistence in fighting him was actually more of an inconvenience. Nevertheless, after defeating the defence forces levied to fight against him, Olaf awaited the arrival of King Ethelred, who soon enough arrived with a large number of his lords and proceeded to pay off the raiders with a huge amount of money in the first recorded instance of Danegeld paid in England. In 995, rumours began to surface in Norway about a king in Ireland of Norwegian blood. The ruler of Norway, Jarl Hakon, had also been weakened due to his wars against the new Danish king Swain Forkbeard, a pagan who rejected the Christian faith. Olaf seized this opportunity and set sail for Norway to capitalise upon the growing instability there. After his arrival, it soon became clear that a revolt had already started against Hakon, and Olaf was able to use his claim to the throne to make himself its figurehead. After his confirmation as King of Norway in 995, Olaf travelled to the parts of Norway that had not been under the rule of Hakon, but the direct rule of the King of Denmark, Swain Forkbeard, and they too swore allegiance to him. He then demanded that the inhabitants of these lands be baptised, and reluctantly they agreed. In 997, Olaf founded his seat of government at Trondheim, where he had first held council with the revolters against Hakon. This new city was situated in a strong defensible position that could easily be defended against land attacks by just one short wall. He built significant amounts of churches throughout his lands and doggedly attempted to convert the pagan inhabitants of Scandinavia, often by the sword. Olaf continued to promote Christianity throughout his rule. He baptised the explorer Leif Erikson in the late 990s, and Leif took a priest with him back to Greenland to convert the rest of his kin. Olaf is also said to have converted the people and the Earl of the Orkney Islands to his new faith, routinely using force to compel conversions to Christianity, including executions and violent torture of those who refused. It has often been said that Olaf's overall ambition was to rule a unified Christian Scandinavia, like Canute managed to do a generation later. It is known that he made overtures of marriage to Sigrid the Haughty, Queen of Sweden during this time, but negotiations fell through due to her steadfast pagan faith. Instead, he made an enemy of her and 
did not hesitate to involve himself in a quarrel with King Swain Forkbeard of Denmark by marrying Swain's sister, Thyre, who had fled from her heathen husband in defiance of her brother's authority. In around the year 1000, Olaf's conflict with Swain would devastatingly come to a head off the island of Svalda in the Western Baltic. Olaf had been travelling with just a handful of ships when he was ambushed by a massive combined fleet of Swedish, Danish and Wendish vessels, together with the ships of the vengeful sons of Jarl Hakon. Olaf fought bravely as one by one his ships were broken apart or captured by the attackers, finally making his last stand upon his huge flagship, the Long Serpent, said to have been the mightiest ship in the north, eventually choosing to leap overboard into the icy Arctic Sea in full armour to his death rather than risk capture by his vengeful enemies. Swain eventually completed what Olaf had wanted, unifying Norway, Denmark and finally England in 1013 into a northern sea empire, ruling only nominally as a Christian king, with his true colours as a pagan lord of war just under the surface. It would be under his son Canute, himself a Christian ruler, that the kingdoms would finally see peace and an unprecedented period of prosperity when for a time, one of the strongest states in Europe was centred upon Scandinavia.